1995, Seven, sometimes stylized as Sev Sevenen, if you want to give it the whole fant four stick treatment, was unleashed on an unsuspecting public and changed the face of serial killer thrillers practically overnight. The film was, of course, a commercial smash hit, but the people that saw it, well, perhaps loved it is the wrong phrase. The film blew their freaking minds. It changed people's ideas about cinematic aesthetics, nihilistic narratives, and downbeat endings in mainstream thrillers. That astonishing, industrialized screen of a title sequence has been imitated slavishly ever since. And as for popularizing the genre, Wikipedia lists 38 serial killer movies in the 70s and 31 in the 90s. In the two decades since Seven, that number goes up to 77 and 81. That is not a coincidence. But despite being so important and so revolutionary, there are still many things audiences aren't aware of about the film. I'm Will Fort Culture, and here are 20 things you never knew about Seven. 20. The idea for the movie came from living in New York. Screenwriter Andrew Kevin Walker was working in a Tower Records in New York when he wrote the Seven screenplay as a spec job. He'd moved away from a very middle-class Pennsylvania suburb in the mid-80s when crack cocaine became an epidemic and the Big Apple felt like it was crawling with maggots. That shocking transition and new experience was the genesis of the Seven screenplay. 19. Somerset is named after the writer's favourite writer. Walker named Freeman's character, Lieutenant William Somerset, after his favourite writer, W. Somerset Morgan. And it's Morgan's most celebrated work of human bondage that's name-checked in Seven when the detectives have the FBI check for library records. That's an oddly appropriate choice for a film obsessed with the carnal brutality of human nature. 18. It was nearly directed by the guy who did National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. When the screenplay was first optioned by Italian production company Penta, who'd been involved when Jeremiah S. Chechik expressed an interest in directing the movie, Walker was required to make substantial changes to his script. Walker recalls the Chechik rewrite's finale taking place in a bombed-out church, with the seven deadly sins represented by a series of paintings, and the general feeling that someone was trying to make a, quote, Batman movie. 17. Brad Pitt wasn't the first choice for the Mills role. Before Pitt was cast as Detective David Mills, the role was offered to one Denzel Washington. At the time, Washington was most famous for playing conflicted but noble men, and his reputation reflected that. He was one of Hollywood's most respected actors. He read the script and turned it down, thinking, this is so dark and evil, quote. Supposedly, Sylvester Stallone also turned down the Mills role, and, like Washington, only realized his mistake once he saw the finished film. 16. Spacey wasn't the first choice either. The showcase John Doe role was originally offered to Val Kilmer, who declined. R.E.M.'s Michael Stipe was also considered. Enter Kevin Spacey, who was still months away from anyone seeing him in the breakout movie roles that would make him such a hot commodity a year later. Apparently, Spacey killed it in the audition, but was asking for too much money, so the casting call continued to go out as production on the movie began. However, after some wrangling, he finally signed on to the role. 15. Neither were Freeman and Paltrow. The other two central roles in the film were also cast using second choice candidates. Walker first envisioned William Somerset being played by William Hurt, but the role was first offered to Al Pacino, who declined due to conflicts over the shooting schedule of City Hall. Fincher had been incredibly impressed by Gwyneth Paltrow's performance in the 1993 neo-noir drama Flesh and Bone, and given that she was Pitt's girlfriend at the time, she was his first choice for the role of Tracy Mills, but she turned the role down. In frustration, Fincher asked his lead to go to bat for him, and Pitt persuaded Paltrow to meet the director, which ended up changing her mind and sealing the deal. 14. The sloth victim had one of the harder victim roles to play. Fincher needed someone cheap and incredibly thin to play the role of the sloth victim, and fortunately, when the unknown Michael Reed McKay auditioned, he weighed 96 pounds. He was asked to lose a little more, but sensibly said no, as starving yourself for your art isn't as noble as people make it sound. McKay's makeup took over 14 hours to apply, so it's arguable that he wasn't necessarily acting when he was finally ready to head to set. 13. There's only one on-screen murder. Considering Seven is regarded as one of the most brutal and violent violent serial killer thrillers in cinema history, there are actually very few acts of violence in the film. In point of fact, John Doe is never seen committing any of the crimes he takes credit for. None of the serial crimes are seen taking place, only their aftermath. 
The only murder that happens on camera is when Mills shoots the unarmed Doe at the climax. All in all, it's odd to think that there are daytime soap operas with more on-screen violence than Seven. Twelve, there was going to be a sequel. Alfonso Poyart's terrible, terrible solace, filmed in 2013 and released in 2016 to a fanfare of absolutely nothing at all, was originally intended to be retooled into a sequel to Seven, which would have hilariously been called A8. New Line eventually dropped the idea and the script was made as was, into a standalone piece of trash that barely merited a release. Thank God it never tarnished Seven's legacy. 11. Instead, there was a comic book. In 2006, Xenoscope Entertainment acquired a license to produce a seven-part limited series based on John Doe's fascination with the Seven Deadly Sins. Pages of the journal glimpsed in the film were included in the arts, but the format precluded against there being any real story, so it's not really a prequel as such, and therefore it's really only for completists and obsessives. Which is handy because it's actually out of print, and the hardcover collection is going for about a hundred bucks on Amazon. 10. David Fincher only agreed to do it because someone sent him the wrong script. When David Fincher was sent the script for Seven, he immediately signed on, but not for the movies the producers actually wanted to make. You see, they made the mistake of sending him the original version of the Seven screenplay, the dark as pitch version with the ugly, brutal ending that we all know and love, when in actual fact they'd forced the writing team to come up with a less dark version of the script to fire off to directors in the hope of it getting picked up. Any other director might have passed on this intense script instantly, but the writing team was in luck. Fincher was a kindred spirit of theirs, and he immediately got what they'd been aiming for with the first run of the idea. The producers quailed and tried to get him interested in the rewrite, but Fincher was insistent that he wanted to make the original version. Not only did Fincher prevail, but he kept Walker, the writer, involved throughout the development process. Hollywood isn't well known for being kind to writers, so Fincher's more collaborative approach with with his screenwriters is a bit of an anomaly, but it makes for cracking movies. 9. Everyone fought to keep that original screenplay and that ending. Not only did Fincher go for the original script with the original ending and the original screenwriter, but he fought hard to keep them all, and so did everyone else on the project. By the time the film was in the final stages of pre-production, it had Morgan Freeman, Brad Pitt, and Kevin Spacey attached to it, and the blessing of New Line's firecracker president of production, Wonderkin movie executive Michael DeLuca. Whenever Fincher's ideas caused trouble, or when lower-ranking executives got wound up about the stupefying bleakness of it all, especially that ending, DeLuca and Fincher's leads would step in. At one point, ideas were coming down the pipe that involved sanitizing the ending by having the dog's head in the box, or, no word of a lie, a TV monitor showing Tracy Mills kidnapped and in peril, but technically rescuable. Fincher and all his friends stuck to their guns. The ending was consonant with the very heart of the story, and it needed to be what it was. Walker is in no doubt as to what kept his movie on course. David Fincher's collaborative mindset and laser focus, and the support of people with influence who believed in the project as much as he did. 8. Kevin Spacey insisted on removing his credit from the beginning of the movie. These days, a Kevin Spacey credit in your movie is definitely more bad than good, but back in the 90s, having Kevin Spacey attached to your movie was a big deal. And as the release of the film approached, New Line stepped in to demand that Kevin Spacey receive top billing over Pitt and Freeman, given the buzz that the usual suspects and Swimming with Sharks had been receiving all year. However, when he heard this, Spacey put his foot down, insisting that this would telegraph his appearance in the film, as anyone who came to the movie knowing he was in it would spend the whole thing waiting for him to materialize, and when he didn't, would quickly figure out that he must be the murderer. Walker agreed, noting how implying that Spacey was the killer would throw the film's audience off balance for fully two-thirds of the film. To compensate, Spacey was listed twice in the closing credits, once as the credits began to roll, and again in order of appearance in the cast list proper. 7. Brad Pitt actually did get injured filming the chase scene. During the scene where Mills legs it after Doe in the rain, Pitt fell and put his arm through a car windscreen. Supposedly, the injury to his hand was so severe that Fincher could see the white of the bone through the jagged hole in his flesh. Pitt still maintains this is the only time he's ever seen Fincher, quote, turn green. The injury required surgery, which would ordinarily delay shooting. However, in this case, they worked the accident into the script, claiming that Doe had attacked Mills and hurt his arm. Just another case of the grim realities of real life dictating art for the better. 6. The lust victim went method to play his character. 
Leland Orsha, the poor schmo who played the poor schmo who was forced at gunpoint to murder a prostitute with a giant bladed strap on, really went 100% to get all his stuff in for his single scene in the film. Interrogated by the police after the fact, Orsha wanted to make sure that he accurately portrayed someone suffering the after effects of significant trauma, and prepared by breathing in and out rapidly so his body would be overly saturated with oxygen, giving him the ability to hyperventilate. He also also barely slept for several days in order to achieve his character's disoriented look. It's a linchpin scene in the film, the first time that Somerset and Mills begin to understand the task ahead of them, so his commitment is definitely appreciated. It's his performance that makes the scene work so well. 5. The other Lust victim didn't get quite as much to do. The actual murder victim in the Lust scenario didn't get as much out of her brief appearance in the movie as her killer did. Kat Mueller was a set director on the film when Fincher's assistant took her to one side and asked whether she fancied playing a dead prostitute in the movie, joking that, quote, she had the personality for it and definitely the body. Mueller wasn't an actor and so wasn't a member of the Screen Actors Guild. She was paid $500 for two days, gagged and tied naked to a bed, with freezing cold fake blood all over her six hours a day. Luckily, as she puts it, the main perk was, quote, being naked in front of Brad Pitt. And that's fair enough, Kat. That is fair enough. 4. The gluttony victim definitely earned his salary. For the gluttony scene, whole crates of cockroaches were poured onto actor Bob Mack, who was 480 pounds at the time and therefore could be considered to have been preparing for the role for most of his life. Mack had no idea he'd have so many tiny scene partners until he saw the call sheet and noted the appearance of a quote, cockroach wrangler. Apparently Brad Pitt flicked the insects off him between takes and guards were placed in his ears and nose to stop the critters from crawling in. In the DVD commentary for the movie, David Fincher said that he felt terribly sorry for Mac, who had to wear incredibly uncomfortable prosthetics for up to 10 hours at a time before shooting would even begin, so he made the character well endowed to compensate, giving the fiberglass dummy they used in the autopsy a large and shapely penis. David Fincher, he's got your back, bro. 3. The greed victim negotiated himself a raise. Greed victim actor Gene Borkin, on the other hand, had a much more pragmatic approach to being asked to strip off and stay still. Hogtied with wire to a chair in a pool of freezing fake blood, he asked for more money. He had originally answered a casting call for a seedy lawyer character and wasn't told what he'd be needed to do until he actually arrived on set. He refused to completely strip off unless Fincher did himself and was rewarded with a pair of silk boxers, which he got to keep because, well, who'd want them back. He also negotiated a pay hike of five times the SAG day scale fee, proving that he was certainly well cast as a smarmy shyster. 2. All of John Doe's books were real. Sort of. All of John Doe's handwritten notebooks were real books. That is, none of them were blanks. Every single one was handwritten specifically for the film, although the same text was used for pretty much every page. And later on, when Somerset reads Mills' portion of one of the books, having taken all of them off the shelves to catalogue them, he reads from the same page we glimpsed earlier on. However, despite this cost-saving exercise, the creation of this monument to monomania took Seven's props department two months to complete, and cost $15,000. Coincidentally, according to Lieutenant Somerset in the movie, it probably would take 15 50 men reading in shifts two months to read all of the books in the room. 1. Some audiences are still convinced that you can see the head. The human mind is a weird and wonderful thing. Despite there being no frame of footage in the finished film that shows any part of a representation of a decapitated head in the courier's box, there are those that insist that they've seen a copy of the film where such footage exists. Fundamentally, people just seem to believe that they've been shown more than they actually have. In some cases, they actually create false memories proving this, removing all shadow of doubt from their minds. In a 2014 interview with Playboy, Fincher attributed this to the quality of the screenplay with typical generosity towards his writing partner. Quote, the thing I appreciated about it and what I thought Andrew Kevin Walker's script did so well was that it got your mind in overdrive. It worked on your imagination. We were in great shape and didn't have to show the head in the box. Despite this, and despite his ongoing assertions that the head in a box has always been implied, Fincher has gotten into at least one knockdown drag out argument with a fan who swears blind that they saw it. But then, that is just the power of great cinema. And there you have it, folks. 20 things you never knew about Seven. 
Feel free to drop this video a like if you enjoyed it, and drop me a follow on Twitter at YouSlyDollU. I'm Will for What Culture. Thanks for hanging out, and I'll see you next time.